Starters reading series. This is our <coughs> second event of the day with um, uh, our guest today is Jericho Brown. This reading is sponsored by um, the College of Arts and Sciences and the English Department and also by the Georgia Initiative uh, Poets. Sorry, Georgia Poets Initiative. Um, all right, so before we start, I would like to ask everyone to turn their cell phones off or turn them on silent. And um, here we go. Um, Jerick Brown grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, and worked as a speechwriter for the mayor of New Orleans before earning his PhD in literature and creative writing from the University, University of Houston. He also holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of New Orleans and graduated with a BA from Lillard University in 1998. Brown is the author of two books of poetry. His most recent collection, The New Testament, was described by Youssef Komuniaka as a chronicle of, quote, life and death, personal rituals and blasphemies, race and nation, the good and the bad, end quote, that illuminates, quote, scenarios of self-interrogation and near redemption, end quote. His first collection of poetry, please, won the 2009 American Book Award. The collection has received tremendous praise since its release. Ilya Kaminsky notes, quote, his lyrics are memorable, muscular, majestic. His voice in these lines is alive, something that is quite rare in his generation of very bookish and very ironic poetics. Brown's poems are living on the page and they give the reader that much, a sense of having been alive fully, if only for a duration of 75 pages of this volume. Indeed, Jericho Brown's first book is one of those rare things, a debut of a master poet, end quote. Jericho Brown is the recipient of a Witting Writers Award and Fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University and the National Endowment for the Arts. His poems have appeared in The New Republic, The New Yorker, and The Best American Poetry. His first book, Please, won the American Book Award, and his second book, The New Testament, won the Anisfield Wolf Book Award and was named one of the best books of the year by Library Journal, Cold Front, and the Academy of American Poets. He is an associate professor in English and creative writing at Emory University in Atlanta. Please uh, join me to welcome Jerry Brown. <laughs> I feel like I'm the bionic man. I have like apparatus. How y'all doing? Yeah. All right. I'm going to um, read a, a few poems, mostly from the New Testament, but I'll also read, uh, I'll touch back to some poems from Please, and I'll also uh, read uh, maybe a couple newer poems that are, are not yet in a volume. Uh, thank y'all so much for coming here. Thank you so much, Bridget, for having me and for all the work that you've done here and to everyone at Clayton State University who has had anything to do with making this visit happen. Thank y'all so much. Please give Bridget a hand though. I keep calling her Bridget, but I keep, I forget I'm supposed to call her Dr. Bird. Uh, so I meant to say give Dr. Bird a hand. I don't want her to feel like, you know, I don't want y'all, y'all don't get to call her Bridget, I do. Uh, uh, so um, I'm just going to read a few poems and I'll, I'll give terms or background before reading the poem uh, where it's necessary. Uh, usually I won't have that problem and I'll just go straight into the, the next poem. Uh, but in the first case of this, in the case of this first poem, 
uh, I, I do need to let you know a little bit of background because I find that I, I've started dating myself. I um, not dating myself like going out, dating myself like I'm getting old. Uh, well, I, you know, I can date myself too. Yeah, I, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And so uh, many of you, many of you will want to know before I read the poem that the radio staple Memory Lane was released posthumously by Capitol Records from the 1979 album Many. Uh, Memory Lane is my favorite song by a singer by the name of Minnie Ripperton. If you don't know who Minnie Ripperton is, it's okay because you, you, many of you, many of you won't, won't know who Minnie Ripperton is, but she's probably the biggest influence for a singer by the name of uh, Mariah Carey. Uh, you may have heard of her. Um, Minnie Ripperton uh, was a huge influence for Mariah Carey because Minnie Ripperton could hit those really high notes on, the, on, on a song that either make you love that song or make you want to turn the stereo down. Um, her most famous song is probably a song that you might know the chorus to is um, a song called Loving You, which is uh, la 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 la, la 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 la, La 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 Dooby dooby doo doo Yeah! All right! Good to have the people here. Track one. Back down. Memory lane. Dangerous men park carefully, slanting oversized automobiles into the ditches that line 77th. It's Friday night in Shreveport. Checks have been cashed, bills folded and stashed into wallets and bra straps. Card tables, folding chairs, and every gold tooth in town crowd our grandmother's camelback shotgun house because gambling's illegal in Shreveport. And she cuts only $2 a hand for every joker that slides into a queen. We don't know Minnie Ripperton's dead years now, buried with one breast to her name. School uniformed in a corner, we learn to listen to music over hollers through smoke. Her soprano comes across a photograph in giggles, but ends up crying, save me. We think we'd like that kind of love, sad and steeped in trumpets, though a block up the entire decade shoots for words to put in the dictionary. Crackhead, drive by, loss, and gain. The bullet meant for a man named Money removes his baby sister's chin. Ask for horns in Shreveport, and sirens are on the way. We can't hear either. Grandmama calling for us to change the tape. No more slow songs. Keep us awake. These years before surgeons slice her in vain and we drive away our car stereos playing rhythm and blues. <laughs> Uh, the most I can say about this next poem is that it is composed entirely of phrases that I heard um, people say in the neighborhood where I was growing up, um, where I'm from in Shreveport, Louisiana. Autobiography. Keep the line steady. Keep your back straight. Keep coming back for more. Keep fucking with me, Cletus. Keep putting your hands on me like that and you'll always have a place to lay your head. Keep my waistline down. Keep your figure up. Keep your man happy. 
keep a woman crazy. Keep your daddy off your mama or next time I'm calling the police. Keep these nappy headed children off my green, green grass. Keep talking smart if you want to. Keep looking at my man and I'll cut you a new eyelid. Keep looking me in my face when you tell your next lie. Keep on walking, I ain't talking to you anymore. Keep holding that last note. Keep singing while I get the splinter out. Keep singing for Jesus, baby, and everything will be all right. Keep me in your prayers. Keep us in your thoughts. Keep your eyes on the black one. He ain't got no sense. Keep your money in your pocket, Nelson. These hoes giving it away. Keep this one occupied. I'll get his wallet. Keep on living, honey, and you'll get old too. I like that y'all, y'all are clappers. I like that. Again. You are not as tired of the poem as I am of the memory. A returning toothache on either side of the mouth. An ingrown hair beneath the chin. Simple itch, bruising, scratch. And again, I am bundled in Cousin Kenny's clothes from last school year. My hand held by my mother's. We walk as if the house behind us isn't warm enough for my feet. In the dark, we make a few blocks around the one-story neighborhood that I loved. Though nothing I've written tells you this, I want to cut it out of me because turns out it never mattered. Right now, my mother's asleep on my father's chest. His arm has landed in the same place around her most of 30 years. Give a man a minute. She's asleep and I'm typing it all over again. Everywhere a man is shifting a bit to make his woman more comfortable in his arm. I should have told you this lines ago. We walked back to the house we ran from because my mother loves her husband and his hands, even if laid heavy against her. I know you don't want to believe that, but give a man a minute. We're not done. My father loves his wife and the shape of her body, even if hunched in retreat, their son keeping up. I'm so sick of it. Another awful father scarring this page too, a bruising scratch. We walked back through an open door. And why don't I mention how he kissed my forehead before covering me on the couch that was my bed. Listen, and you can hear them in the next room, planning names for the youngest of us, then making love loud enough for the oldest to learn. Thank you. Labor, you just got here and you leaving. Oh, he, he made his deal. Y'all hurry up so I can read this next poem faster. Faster, faster, faster. That's your best. <laughs> My God. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Sorry, I'm sorry. I have a bad habit of having a good time. Um, okay. 
I mean, he for real just got here. I ain't even say nothing about his people or nothing. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't come here for that. Just read poems, right? <laughs> Jericho, read your poem. Okay. Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating and learned to cuss, cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damned difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tighter than a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I call them old and they must have been. They're all dead now, dead and in the earth. I once tended the loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age, only mothers to baby them and big sisters to boss them around. Women, they want to please and pray for the chance to say please to. I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say, I once had something to do with my hands. Mm. Almost done, y'all. I'm, I'm serious. Um, I'm gonna shift gears here and I'll just read a couple of persona poems. A persona poem is of course, a poem that is most definitely not in the voice of the poet. And so you can write a persona poem in the voice of a, um, a historical figure or even in the voice of a character you make up. Um, for instance, the poet I, who is one of my favorite poets. She has many persona poems. Um, her name is I, A, I. I just spelled that on the board in case y'all want to know what I was doing over there. Uh, <laughs> I'm such a teacher, I like automatically like think about going to the board. Um, the poet I has poems in the voice of Marilyn Monroe. She has poems uh, in the voice of Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, and this first uh, persona poem that I'm going to read for you is in the voice of, um, well, it's in the voice of another poet. It's in the voice of the poet I always think of as my first poet. And I say that with the same affection that we say phrases like first love and first kiss. I remember being a kid in the library and coming across these poems and feeling like I had uh, fallen in love. The only things that you need to know before I read the poem are that he was the leading figure of that major uh, literary movement in American literature known as the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, his favorite singer was a woman named Bessie Smith who is also known as the Empress of Blues. Um, Bessie Smith's life was actually turned into a biopic um, for HBO recently starring Queen Latifah. Uh, the poem also has a, a quote in it, which is a direct quote from him uh, before the Senate Committee on Un-American Activities during the uh, Red Scare of the 1950s, during McCarthyism, where a time in our history in this nation where if you said uh, something, if you sneezed in the wrong direction, people would accuse you of being a communist and then blackball you from all, all kinds of life, uh, economically and socially. And um, oh, the last thing that it's good to remember before I read the poem is that he wrote what might be his most famous poem. He wrote, The Negro Speaks of Rivers when he was 18 years old. You know, every time I think about that, every time I think about the fact that Langston Hughes wrote a poem that great, I mean, there's no anthology that you can pick up that does not include The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Every time I think about Langston Hughes writing The Negro Speaks of Rivers, a poem that amazing, when he was only 18 years old, I really hate Langston Hughes. <laughs> Langston's Blues. O blood of the river of songs, 
O songs of the river of blood, let me lie down. Let my words lie sound in the mouths of men, repeating invocations pure and perfect as a moan that mounts in the mouth of Bessie Smith. Blues for the angels kicked out of heaven. Blues for the angels who miss them still. Blues for my people and what water they know. Oh, weary drinkers, Drinking from the bloody river. Why go to heaven with Harlem so close? Why sing of rivers with fathers of our own to miss? I remember mine and taste a stain like blood coursing the body of a man chased by a mob. I write his running, his sweat. Here he climbs a poplar for the sky, but it is only sky. The river? Follow me. You'll see. We tried to fly and learned we couldn't swim. Dear singing river full of my blood, are we as loud under water? Is it blood that binds brothers? Or is it the Mississippi running through the fattest vein of America. When I say home, I mean I wanted to write some lines. I wanted to hear the blues, but here I am, swimming in the river again. What runs through the fat veins of a drowned body? What America can a body call home? When I say Congo, I mean blood. When I say Nile, I mean blood. When I say Euphrates, I mean, if only you knew what blood we have in common. So much in Louisiana, they call a man like me red. And red was too dark for my daddy. And my daddy was too dark for America. He ran like a man from my mother and me. And my mother's sobs are the songs of Bessie Smith, who wears more feathers than death. Oh, the death my people refuse to die. When I was 18, I wrote down the river, though I couldn't win a race. Climbed a tree that winter, then fell flat on my wet red face. Line after line, I read all the time, but there was nothing I could do about race. Janis Joplin recorded the Gershwin Standard Summertime with Big Brother and the Holding Company for their 1968 chart-topping album, Cheap Thrills. She died of a heroin overdose in 1970. Um, when she died, she was, she was 27 years old. Track five, Summertime, as performed by Janis Joplin. God's got his eye on me, but I ain't a sparrow. I'm more like a lawnmower. No, a chainsaw. Anything that might mangle each manicured lawn in Port Arthur, a place I wouldn't return to if the mayor offered me every ounce of oil my daddy cans at the refinery. My voice, I mean, ain't sweet. Nothing nice about it. It won't fly, even with Jesus watching. I don't believe in Jesus. The Baxter boys climbed a tree just to throw persimmons at me. The good and perfect gifts from above hit like lightning, leave bruises. So I lied. I believe, but I don't think God likes me. The girls in the locker room slapped dirty pads across my thighs face. They called me bitch, but I never bit back. 
I ain't a dog. Chainsaw, I say. My voice hacks at you. I bet I tear my throat. I try so hard to sound jagged. I get high and say one thing so many times, like Willie Baker who worked across the street. I saw some kids whip him with a belt while he repeated, please. School out, summertime and the living lashed. Mama said I should be thankful that the town's worse to coloreds than they are to me, that I'd grow out of my acne. God must love Willie Baker, all that leather, and still a please that sounds like music. See, I wouldn't know a sparrow from a mockingbird. The band plays, I just belt out, please. This tune ain't half the blues. I should be thankful. I get high and moan like a lawnmower so nobody notices. I'm such an ugly girl. I'm such an ugly girl. I try to sing like a man. Boys call boy. I turn my face to God. I pray. I wish I could pour oil on everything green in Port Arthur. And I will, um, I will finish with a, a recent poem. This, this last poem was written after finding out about and being, uh, and being confounded by the details surrounding uh, the deaths of people like Tyrone White and Jesus Huerta and Sandra Bland. Um, and I wish that list was just that short, but the funny thing about researching is that you find out, though you, you don't want to find out, you find out that things are, are even worse than what you had imagined. Um, and so that list actually goes on and on. Um, so this poem, is, um, this poem is for the people whose names are on that list. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head and I will not shoot myself in the back and I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots and the ants and the roaches who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will kill me the same way most Americans do. I promise you, cigarette smoke or a piece of meat on which I choke or so broke I freeze. In one of these winters, we keep calling worst. I promise that if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than what a city can pay a mother to stop crying, and more beautiful than the brand new shiny bullet fished from the folds of my brain. Thank y'all so much. <laughs> So this is um, my favorite part of, of, of a reading, and it's, it's the part that isn't reading. It's the part where I get to answer questions, which I enjoy doing. Uh, and I guess some of you saw me do that earlier. So uh, y'all are welcome. Betty's leaving. Bye, Betty Shabazz. Uh, so that if anybody has any questions, I can take them now. 
You can ask me about anything. You can ask me about poetry. You can ask me how long it took me to get my hair done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you about the cover of the show. Okay. What does it mean? So it's a, um, it's a painting from a, a 19th century French painter named Leon Bonnet, um, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong. Um, can you, maybe I should, I, should ask, I should ask Dr. Bird to say Leon Bonnet. Um, and the, but the painting is, um, as far as I can tell from what I know about him, it's the only, only time he depicted black people which was really exciting for me. And somebody just sent it to me after the book had already been taken and accepted for publication. Somebody who knows that I'm a lover of art sent me the image and was like, oh, look at this. And I was like, oh my God, that's my book. And it seems to me, it seemed to me perfect for the book because it has, you know, it's that, um, this image in particular, it's just such an image, the, the, the image of the barber and the, the client in that moment of the shave. It's so tender and at the same time so dangerous. And so that's always what I'm trying to get to when I write my poems, right? I'm trying to get to that which is safety and risk at the same time, right? That which makes us feel comforted and that which makes us uncomfortable at the same time. And that's what I want my poems to do. And I felt like this painting was really trying to get at that. Um, and so that's how I ended up getting, it was funny because the, my editor had already started the process of finding someone to do a cover for the book. And I called him on the phone and I said, hey, you gotta see this thing. And he was like, Jericho, man, cause he was getting sick of me calling him on the phone. Cause there was always something, you know, I'm like, oh, we should, and he'd be like, so he was like, Jericho, man, I'll look at it, but I'm telling you, we have already started contacting people for cover art. So it's doubtful that I'm going to be interested. I was like, okay, well, you want to see this. So he looked at it. He called me back. And he was like, okay, yeah, we got to get that. So, yeah, I'm really glad that we could get it for the, for the book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Andrea. Hey, Andrea. Hey. And I'm taking Dr. Bird's advanced poetry writing class. That's good. Congratulations. Thank you. And last year I took her intro to creative writing class, and we – were forced to buy um, the great, the best American in poetry in 2014. I'm in that, huh? Yeah, host. I'm in that. Yeah, host. Host was my the host with a T, not hose. Host. <laughs> Don't talk. Okay. It was the only poem in that anthology that I really liked. Nothing else about Bird, but modern poetry it kind of sounded like babbling to me. Uh huh. Because we got the 2015 version, and most of the poems were like, what, what am I reading? But then I read this, and I'm like, oh, these are, these are so much better. So <laughs> my question And that's, that's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer to your question. No. This is actually the best book ever written. <laughs> my question is, when you write your poetry, do you focus primarily on craft of poetry as far as like imagery, rhythm, and the line breaks, or do you focus more on getting your point across to a reader? Okay, that's a really good question. I, um, I don't focus on getting my point across to a reader, but I think that happens because of what my interests are. And I am interested in the vernacular. I'm interested in the way people speak to one another, and I'm interested in whether or not I can use the way we talk and sort of lift it just a little bit above the way we talk. So I don't want to go all the way to like speech making speech or sermonic speech, but I want to find somewhere just above conversation, right? That I want to make use of in my poems. And I think that use of vernacular in the poems probably sounds a lot like getting the point across, you know? It's interesting though that you would like a poem like Host because I actually don't understand that poem at all. I didn't say I understood. Oh, okay, good. Because I'm like, I don't know what this poem is about, but I like it. It's happening. It's going in the book. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I mean, I, I have an idea of what it, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be so glib. I have an idea of what it's about, but I don't, I mean, it's very different from a poem like the first poem I read tonight, which has a very direct narrative about where I grew up, what my grandmother was like, 
how she used to hold card games. You know, like you can sort of pull that and it's direct, whereas I think host is much more fragmented in certain ways. Um, and so I think when I'm writing, what I do is I try to pay attention to music first and I try to get a draft done that really doesn't make any sense whatsoever, just based on the music or the sounds of language. And then from that, I start asking myself questions. And these questions are similar to the questions that we ask. I mean, we're human beings, so we like to give narrative to things. Even if we just see two people talking across the way, we're like, oh, this is what they're talking about. We don't even know them people. Do, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Or we do this when we look at abstract art. I mean, we do it when we look at concrete art. We want to give it a beginning, a middle, and an end. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I think that's a very human, the story is very human. And so I look at that thing that I've created that is mostly sounds and lines that often have nothing to do with each other. And I start asking myself questions. Who's the speaker? Um, what are their motivations? Why is this moment important? What is happening? You know, I start, and then I try to answer those questions in the revision of the poem. So for instance, in the poem that I wrote, uh, that I read for y'all uh, in the voice of Janis Joplin, I didn't know that that poem was going to be in the voice of Janis Joplin until somewhere way down the line in revisions, right? While I was revising the poem, I knew I had written a line, I'm such an ugly girl, I'm such an ugly girl. I knew I had written that line and that just sounded good to me, right? And so I wrote it down and I trusted that if it sounds good to me, I can write it down and move forward with my life. I don't have to stress, stress out about what it means, who it belongs to, not at this point anyway. I know it's not from my own experience. I'm not a girl. I'm clearly not ugly. So <laughs> I love y'all because y'all laugh at all my jokes. Y'all are my favorite. Anyway, so, so, so later I, I decide, well, who do I know might say this? Who in my history or who do I know about that might say something like this? And I, because I know Janis Joplin's music because I was that kind of a nerd when I was a kid where I was listening to Janis Joplin. Right. I'm like, oh, that must be Janis Joplin. This is what I know her biography. This is what she would say. And then I can sort of imbue the poems with more of what I know. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's how I do it. But I'm glad you like that poem. Though. Yeah, I'm glad you like that poem. I'll tell you this, though. I'm not a big fan of that best American poetry either. There are some poems in it that I like. Um, but I like the most recent one better. There's one that just came out with Sherman Alexie. Yeah, we that, have that one. Yeah, I like that one better. Did you read the Dear Black Barbie movie? Yeah, like I like, I think, I think pound for pound there are more poems in there that I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Denise Duhamel had one the year before Terrence Hayes's, which is sort of interesting too. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, you you can go and I can come back. We'll come we'll come to her. Come on, I didn't see. Hey Frank. Hey Dr. Green. I'm glad you came too. I am. Yes. And does that encourage or help you direct your direction? It help direct you to focus on poetry or let's say writing Does that play a factor in your first career? Yeah, I think being from the South has a lot to do with my obsessions with vernacular. There's a poem, for instance, that's in the book called Nim, right? And y'all hear me say Nim and y'all like, what's a Nim? But that's a word we use every day because y'all have said before, how is your mama and Nim? I mean, we've done that. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? And because, of, because I have that language here, uh, for instance, when I, I lived in California for five years, and I grew up, I had no idea that I had, and I think it's been beaten out of me. Uh, maybe I don't as much as I used to, because people say they don't hear it as much. But I didn't know I had this really big Louisiana accent until I moved to the West Coast. And people would have to tell me, people would say, what? What are you saying? And I'd be like, I'm, 
I'm, I'm speaking English. <laughs> like, what do you mean? What am I saying? <laughs> I don't understand. They wouldn't understand what I was saying. And part of it is because I was using words like nim, you know what I mean, when I would speak. Uh, so I think where you're from can play a huge role in, in what you're doing. It also can play, it has a, a lot to do with how you conceive of language, but it also has a lot to do with what images you make use of. So the images of uh, things like a crepe myrtle or a magnolia tree might enter my poems here in ways that they wouldn't enter when I was living in San Diego. When I was living in San Diego, over and over again, I found sand and sea in my poems. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, but I, didn't see, I don't have that as much now that I'm back in the South, right? And so the images have to do with like, what you're experiencing at that moment around you. So does that answer you? Yes. Yeah. Now this question right here, this one. Yeah. Yes. Um, I had to do a presentation in your book, and I found the most very. Did you win? Did I win? Did I win, Dr. Gary? <laughs> 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 I won. Um, but one poem in particular stuck out for me, and that um, is Hustle, and I didn't know what a persona poem was until about 15 minutes ago when you explained it. So, was that a persona poem, or is that a biographical? Hustle is, um, in a way, it's a persona poem, but it's, if it's a persona poem, it's a persona poem for a multiplicity of, of voices. What it is, is it's a form called the Huzzle, which has a lot to do with why I chose it as a, a, um, a title. Huzzle is um, spelled G-H-A-Z-A-L, and it's actually our oldest form. It comes from sixth century uh, Persia, right? Uh, it goes really far back, and the way the form works is, I'll explain it to y'all, and y'all just hold on. The way the form works is it's a poem that's written in, co in couplets. Y'all know formal poems, you know sonnets, you might know villanelles or pantoums, but you've heard of sonnets before. You've heard of things like iambic pentameter. Well, what the huzzle requires is that you write a poem in couplets and that each couplet has to sort of be its own poem. And that the next couplet can't have anything to do with the last couplet. And the next couplet can't have anything to do with the last couplet. And so in that way, it's not as narrative or chrono chronological or, or they don't have this kind of con contiguous, contiguous, this contiguous nature that we expect literature to have. Do, does that make sense? So the other rule that goes with writing a huzzle is that you rhyme at the end. Like at the end of every couplet, you have to use the same word in spite of the fact that every couplet is about a different thing. So in this particular huzzle that I, in the book, the huzzle I, I, you're referring to, I use the word prison because it's something I'm obsessed by because I can't believe that so many black people and so many Latino people are in prison and everybody's trying to act like that is normal. And when you look at any kind of a graph of the number of people and how much this has changed over the years, it's absolutely horrendous. And the truth is that we built big business off of black and Latino people going to prison. It has become an economic way of going in the world, but we don't benefit from it because we have to go to prison. But that's a whole nother story. So, um, and there's a rhyme that has to precede each of those ending words. And that rhyme that I chose was ear, which is why uh, you'll see here, here in prison or near in prison. Do you, understand, do you, you see what I mean? So, um, and, that, and then the, the last part of the form is that you have to say your name in the final couplet, which so is, that is yeah, that's, that's Jericho Brown. And so Jericho Brown. Have to go to to oh God, no! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yeah, I might, I might run around. You don't know how close I have been. You don't know. I will. I will run. <laughs> y'all want to? Y'all ain't never seen this shout. <laughs> y'all have seen a few shouts, but y'all ain't seen the one I got. I got a special shout for that. Um, no, Lord, no. Hey. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I just had a private moment. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. At that point, at that point, as in in other points in the poem, like in the first, in the first couplet, prison is literal. And then what I do in different, because the couplets have to be, are not supposed to be related, what I do is every time I use prison, I use it in a different way. And so, you know, there are prisons that we have in our minds, right? Uh, there are prisons 
that many of us are living in that aren't that have no bars, but we're in a we're imprisoned in some of the relationships that we're in. We're, there are many kinds of prisons, and so what? Oh, well, bless you. I can't believe this is the funniest reading I ever gave in my life. I promise y'all, I give a lot of readings, but y'all are the, y'all are like the Ed Sullivan show. I promise. Okay, uh, but like, do you do you understand what I'm saying? So by that time. I'm talking more. There are other moments that are probably more personal in the um, in there. But then there are some moments in it that aren't as personal. Dwayne Betts, by the way, is a young man who he he's a character in the first. He's a character in the first stanza. And Dwayne Betts is a young man who went on a joy ride when he was uh, they he, he and some older friends of his when he was 14 years old, they stole a car and they got caught because that's what happens. You get caught. And he was tried as an adult and sent to prison for 10 years. He was 14 years old. And I think that's crazy. Do you understand? He has a memoir about that uh, called A Question of Freedom. Um, and he's a really good, he's a poet too. He's a good friend of mine. And um, the, uh, the next couplet, or maybe the one after that, I'm not looking at it, references one of my favorite movies, a movie um, called Love Jones. If y'all haven't seen Love Jones, if you haven't seen Love Jones, you really should, um, because it's perfect for a date night. Uh, it works every time. <laughs> I, I won't tell you nothing I don't know. It's perfect for a date night, and that's the best advice you're ever going to get at a poetry reading. But th- it, mentions, um, it mentions those characters that Nia Long and Lorenz Tate play, Nina and Darius. Right. Um, and then so it goes from there where it's making reference to very disparate things. Does that help? Yeah. Oh, what does it mean? Oh, well, Jericho actually quite literally means straightly shut up, but it's loosely translated um, defense. It could also mean good smelling because there are these flowers around the it, I'm not making that up. <laughs> she looked at me like how convenient. <laughs> Oh, good, good smelling, I bet. I promise I'm not trying to make a move on you right now. Yeah, I said good smelling, she was like. I love it, that was wonderful. Anyway, there are all these, these flowers around the city of Jericho, the, the literal, the real city of Jericho where there are, um, that sort of emit this smell that people start smelling that aroma when they come into the city. And then the last name Brown. So I was born Nelson Demery the third and I changed my name to Jericho because I started that third always got on my nerves. And when I started publishing poems, it really got on my nerves because I hated the fact that I, I mean, I don't know if I would feel this way today, but at the time I really hated the fact that these poems that were sort of, in my mind, rebelling against my father or rebelling against my family still had that name on them. <laughs> and I wanted something that was all and completely mine. Do you understand what I mean? And so I sort of had this dream. And in the dream, after waking from the r- dream, I resolved to change my name to Jericho. And I couldn't decide on a last name, but I didn't want to be like these people who walk around calling themselves like, you know, Monica. I don't even know Monica's last name. Do y'all know Monica's? Brown. Brown. That's it, Brown. She's my sister. And uh, <laughs> um, I didn't want to be like Madonna. You know, I didn't want to be doing all that. I wanted a last name, and I wanted my name to be four syllables, because I noticed that all of the Jackson kids have, have four syllables last name, except Latoya, which explains the problem. So anyway, I really wanted, I really wanted that. And then I remembered that um, I went to school and I used to sing with, um, I know I sound a mess, y'all, but I blend it, I promise. Um, I used to, but I used to sing with um, these kids, this girl named Shanetta Brown, she could really sing. And, um, I went to school, my best friend in school was a, a guy named Jason Brown, and I pledged, my line brother, we went to high school together, but he was also my line brother, my first college roommate, was, and we all sang together. And they all had the, last, the same last name, so we were always Shanetta and the Browns, right? And so it was crazy because my last name wasn't Brown and I was mad (laughs) that I wasn't. So it was my chance to finally be a Brown. 
So that does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. There's only one, the first one, the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity <laughs> Incorporated. <laughs> Y'all, thank you. <laughs> Y'all are hilarious. <laughs> That's so funny. I wish I could take y'all with me everywhere I go. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, any other questions, please? Yes. Oh, she asked. <laughs> She's gonna ask me if she can have my firstborn. She asked. <laughs> we had a Q and A earlier, and she was like, she was like, which hair on your head do you like the most? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, flats or drumsticks? <laughs> okay, I'm listening. So, um, I just wanted to know, um, you said that when the, that Jericho Brown was your birthday, so I just want to know if you legally change your name to Jericho Brown or is it just something that you use to brand yourself? It's, I guess, something I use to brand myself, although I don't think of it that way. I mean, I don't really think of myself. I know people are really interested in this whole what is your brand or sort of following your brand. But that's not of use to me because if I do that, then I won't be my whole self all the time. And that's sort of my fight in life. My fight in life every day is like, how can I be the most authentic self that I can be? And if I start thinking in terms of brand, then I won't tweet what I want to tweet when I want to tweet it. I won't say what I want to say. You know, it's really important to me that what I do in front of you and what I do with my students back at Emory and what I do when I'm at home by myself and what I do when I'm at home and I got company, that all of that sort of lines up. I really want that to line up. Does that answer you? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Artie. I, I, all day. I don't forget. I'm not a forgetter. Uh, the question I have is from earlier, um, and I'm getting to ask it now, is because eventually I like to become an author. Perhaps a poet. Anyway, um, my question is, when you relate it to um, all of the people in your life that you get your material for, um, is it illegal? write about, you know, my relatives, my, do I need to, you know, put another name, put a fictitious name in there and talk about no. sensitive issues? No. Why would you do that? Mm -mm. No. I mean, I said this earlier today and I really do believe it. If people want really, de really good depictions of themselves in literature, they need to act better in real life. And that goes for us too, you know, and you can't, but that doesn't mean that we should write. And I hope I make this clear in my own writing in both books. M my job as a poet, and I think this about all of us as writers, but my job as a poet is not to sit around going after people and letting everybody have it and this is what's wrong with you and this is your shade and this is my read for you. It's not like I don't live my life like that and I'm not interested in being the source of that because I don't want that coming to me. So what I start with in any poem I write is myself. And if you can be hard on yourself in a poem, that is what is going to give you license to be hard on anybody else. But you have to be honest about the fact that you are not perfect and you have done some crazy stuff too, just like some crazy stuff has been done to you. And if you can find a way to get that in a poem, then hey, let them have it. Give it to them hard. Because the truth is the truth and that's what's the most important thing in poetry. I am in love with you, Jerry. Thank you so much, I love you more. Thank you. I'm coming back to you right here, <laughs> sir. I love it. Yes, thank you. I'm curious to know how important is it to have music in your writing process? You mean, do I listen to it before or during? Is that what you mean? Or? I mean, it, it seems to me that there's a, a significant influence. Yeah. In your well, you know, this is the interesting thing about being a writer. It's not the same as working as, I mean, I don't think it's the same. I don't know, because I'm trying to, it's like, it's, I don't, hmm. that might not be true. 
I'm gonna say something that might not be completely true, but I wanna use it as an example that I think everyone will understand and then don't attack me about the example. I don't think you, turn, you, you don't get the opportunity to turn off being a writer. Like a line can come to me at any time. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? If you work at, if you check people out at Publix, right? When you clock out, people don't, people ain't stopping you at Kroger's like, hey, <laughs> do you understand? Like, hey, here's my chicken. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Like, did, like, whereas like when you're a writer, it's all the time. So to what degree music, I think music has been everything to my poetry. I would not be able but it's all, but it's so much everything that it's nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like there is, like you don't, like if you in my house, music is playing. And if music's not playing, it's because I'm watching TV or because I'm reading or because I'm writing. But in order to like get, like in order for me to get out of my bed, into the bathroom and from the bathroom into the kitchen, I got to have music. And that's just the way my life is and always ha has been. Even when I was a kid, I was that way. So I can't imagine that living that life doesn't have something to do with the poetry I write. Does that answer you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Was there a question over there? No? I'm just trying to see if I can get people who haven't asked the question yet before. Right here, yes. I'm going to come back to y'all. I don't mind. I just want to make sure. Yes, right here. Your hair is so pretty. I love it. Yeah. Um, so my advice, I talked to Khadija. I think her name is Khadija. Did I forget that? Where is she? Is she still? Khadidra. I talked to Khadidra about this earlier today, so I'm sorry you have to hear this answer again. I think it's really important that if you want to be something, you put yourself in the position of that thing. Right. So if you want to be rich, you need to go drive by some real big houses. Even if you live in a shack, just make sure you take the long way home and that you are always driving by the big houses. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if you want to be a poet, that means you need to be somewhere reading poems. You need to go to readings. You need to find workshops. You need to be a part of communities because there are going to be days, there are still days. I mean, I am a poet and I know I'm a poet, but there are still days where I'm like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I need a community. I need to be on the phone with my friends who are also poets who can say, Jericho, you all right. You're going to write another poem. All is well. Do you understand what I mean? And you have to have that for whatever your endeavor might be. But you also have to. So I think I think it's a, I was actually telling a friend of mine this. I have a friend of mine um, named Anthony Wayne, who is on this in this Broadway show called um, called Mighty Real. And in the show, he plays this musician we both have a we're he's he's actually an actor singer dancer and I'm a poet um, so he's like a performer performer but we have a uh, this huge love of music in common but he plays a man named Sylvester who many of you won't know yeah. but, but some of you clearly do know <laughs> Sylvester is most known for singing this song um, you make me feel Mighty real, except he sings it in soprano, like he sings it really high. And he actually, Martha Walsh um, used to sing, y'all know that, that chorus that's like, dun, 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 everybody dance now, like that, that's Martha Walsh. Anyway, he plays him in this play, this, the play is about him. And we were talking about like what the steps were, like how do we get the things that we want. And I think the first thing is that you set the intention and you're honest with yourself about it. You make time and space and you say, I want to be a poet or I want to be a writer. And you just make that the truth of who you are. And if you can just start there, if you can start with identification, then you'll be okay. But often when we make these, 
whenever, I mean, and this, this goes for poetry, but it goes for anything. We often make something and then we go tell our friend and they say, I mean, you know, like my mom and dad didn't think that I would be able to do what I do for a living. They didn't. And that's not their fault. Like, I don't hold that against them. They did everything in their power to stop it. They're like, please, just like everything. And I would be like, mm, OK, that's your business, but I'm going to be a poet. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? And you have, to, you have to make up your mind that you're going to do the thing that you're going to do. And then you have to act like it. So whatever, whatever identity you hold, then stand in the space of that identity and do those things. What do writers do? They write. And it's a lot of people around here talking about they want to be a writer, but they don't ever want to write. How you want to be a writer and you don't want to read nothing? Let me ask you this question. This is a, this is a really easy question, too. Has LeBron James ever seen a basketball game he did not play in? Wow. What's the answer to that question? Yes. And so when you read a book, you need to be reading a book with the same eyes that LeBron James watches basketball. That'll make you a writer. Like you need to be reading the steal. Do you understand what I'm saying? You need to be reading like, oh, that's what they're doing over there? Oh, I could do that. Oh, that's what they're doing over there? I don't like that. They could have done better. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like you need to put yourself in the position. And I think that's how you make the thing come to pass. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you are transitioning into doing plays mm -hmm. um, in your last session. Yes, God. Um, my question is that do you know how far that you see yourself with your first production and will it be in the metro Atlanta area? Yeah, we're doing a workshop of the play, which will probably be made public the last, um, the last week of January. Maybe it bleeds into the first week of January. So we'll be working, and it's called BNV, Brave New Voices, at um, Emory University. So I have to turn in a first draft of the play November 3rd. I'm actually collaborating with somebody who is a playwright. And this first play is easier than, than what some other things might be because it's, a, um, it's an adaptation. They're turning my poems into a play. So it's just that we have to like create a whole new reason for these poems to be spoken by various people as opposed to all the poems just being spoken by one person. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that workshop will be first, but then who knows what will happen after that. I don't have a date for, but there will be a reading of the play at the end of that workshop. You can, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, I have a, an addiction to Twitter, so you can always at me. I'm at Jericho Brown on Twitter. Okay. Um, if you're not a Twitter person, then you can go to JerichoBrown.com, or you can go to Facebook, but Facebook kind of makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. So I always, it does. Um, and I, but I, so I forget sometimes that I have a Facebook page, but I, I generally update it when stuff is happening. It's just that I'm not very social on Facebook. And so people are always, I'm saying that in case anybody sends me a, a message on Facebook and I don't respond. It's not because I'm mean or rude. It's just easier to get me by email if you just want to talk or to call me <laughs> than it is for you to send me a Facebook message. Because Facebook, I'd be like, I don't know why I feel that way about Facebook. I never did get into it, though. Well, it's, I, it's clearly, it's terrible and it's the devil. Okay. <laughs> and now I know. <laughs> yes. Um, two questions. First question is, um, many of your poems sound like you, they can actually be spoken word pieces. Yeah. That, that they cannot just be, you know, read and enjoyed. Yeah. Actually be performed. Yes. Do you see, is that intentional? And do you see a difference between more traditional kind of and spoken word. And who does my hair? Um, Royce does my hair, and I can give him, I can give you give you. He's really good, but he's always running late. He's in Midtown, and he. Um, I mean, I'm just telling you to deal. Um, but he's so good that you have to deal with, what you got to deal with. You know what I mean? Which is the way it is when you want to have hair. So that's the second question. And the first question I don't even remember because. When we start talking about hair, that's it. Oh, yeah. You start talking about hair, I'll just go. Just hair, Diana Ross. Like, I just forget everything. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, let's see, spoken word. So all of this is poetry. 
and poetry has different genres. And we are comfortable with that in fiction, right? And I think that if we're comfortable with that in fiction, we should begin to be comfortable with that in poetry. So that's the first thing that I have to say. The second thing that I have to say is that many of the poems that I write do seem spoken word or performance oriented, probably because of how I grew up. I grew up in the church. I grew up with parents who were like always, you know, if there was, you know, I, you go to the, when you grow up in the black church, there's a reason to give a speech for everything. And you know, you'll be five years old and the speech will be like this long. And you'll be like, it's memorized. And you have to give up, get up and give it. And you know, black people are a certain kind of way. So <laughs> they want everything you got. Do you know what I mean? And so I think having those experiences growing up and also just loving um, my pastor's sermons when I was growing up, just sort of being enchanted by, I mean, even the way our pastor would enter the pulpit, we would be in the choir and he would um, sort of come out of nowhere. I never knew, I still today don't know where he came from. <laughs> It's like you would suddenly see him going up the steps to the pulpit and he would just be there. Or sometimes he would just be in the pulpit. And I'm like, when did he get here? <laughs> Do y'all know what I'm saying? And he'd be like, Hi, why are you in the pulpit? Where did you come from? He didn't come from the choir loft. So I, he didn't, like, it would be weird. But anyway, that's a, that, yeah. He had a like rising stage. Anyway, um, <laughs> but hearing the rhythms of his delivery over and over again, I think were hugely influential for me. And I think that uh, when I grew up, of course, part of how I came to poetry, I had written word poetry in the beginning of the first poems I experienced. But then when I moved to New Orleans, I was, there was a huge spoken word and slam scene, and I was a part of that scene. And I understood that, you know, you have to deliver your poems in certain ways. And then I began sort of moving away from that and back to the written word and so I think some of that stuff is still with what I put on the page. So yeah, I think it's real, but I think it calls for different things. The endings, for instance, are much different, right? The ending of um, what we might think of as a written word or a literary poem often leaves us wondering, we, ha we end with more questions than what we had, whereas the end of a spoken word poem tells us exactly what we're supposed to know. Do you understand what I mean? So those things are just, parts of what characterizes each of those genres. That's the way I think about it. Is that, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned earlier that in order to, you know, stay in what you're saying, you have to stay in basically your community. So if it's a Saturday night and they have stuff on, where can we find you at? Okay. My favorite spot has always been Apache. Yeah, the patch is cool. The, yeah. I, I like the mirror, especially on yeah. Sundays. Yeah. So where, where will you be mostly found, especially in Atlanta where everything is found? Well, probably not. I'm probably on an airplane on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. I don't get to. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed to have the opportunity to give readings at universities. I'm so, y'all don't know how happy I am when something happens for me in Atlanta because it means I don't have to get on an airplane. It means I can spend the night in my own bed. And y'all think that's like, that sounds real. Like, I'm, I'm really grateful, don't get me wrong. But like, you get sick of being in the air. Like, you know what I mean? And then you, sometimes you're in the air for nothing. Like, you be in the air for like an hour. Like, what was I in the air for? Do you know, like, like it took me longer to stand in the line than, than to be in the air. Um, so, I, there's, there aren't really places that I frequent because I teach a workshop at, at Emory, I think being involved with certain workshops before were of, there was a workshop for um, African American writers in New Orleans that I joined when I was very young, when I was probably the age of most of the people in this room, um, maybe just a year or two older, uh, called No More Literary Society. We would meet every Tuesday night at six o'clock and we would literally, everybody who was there would read what they wrote that week. And you know, it wasn't that whole, like in workshop that said school, you pass it out, you know, and people have, a, have it at least a week before and they can write on it and make comments. It wasn't none of that. It was like then and there, this is what we think you got wrong. <laughs> you 
you know, and we would leave there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it would be fights. I mean, I remember, um, and I just got lucky, you know, poets like Terrence Hayes, Major Jackson, Toy Derricott, writers like Gloria Wade Gales. Um, the workshop was led by Kalamu Yasalam, who's a huge New Orleans poet, um, would come through or would be a part of the workshop for the duration of the time they were living in New Orleans. And, you know, if you have to create your own community, you create your own community workshop. Um, after that, I got really involved with Cave Canem, which is a workshop for poets, for, African, for poets of African descent. And being in that workshop was big for me. Uh, but that was only in the summers. You know, I would go, you go there, you go for a week, and you go for three summers. And, but that was a huge opportunity for me. So I just think you have to keep your eyes open. Y'all know when you look for something, it will appear, right? It's like that thing that happens when you get a new car, and all of a sudden you see every car that's like that car, and you never saw that car before. It's like that. And so all you have to do is sort of put in the air the thing you want. Like if you put it in your thought, then it, it makes its way to you, or you make your way to it. All right, second round. Huh? I said, all right, nursing degree. <laughs> nursing degree. Exactly. You could do that for a degree. Yes. Oh, wait. I went down here. Was there somebody who hadn't asked the question who had a question? Because we on second. Yes, sir. You are a great person to have in the audience, I have to say. You, you really are. No, he's the most. Is he your student? Whose student? He's just like. I mean, he's there. I mean, I, I've never seen anybody so. Pre I mean, y'all are some of the most present people I have ever had in the audience before in my life. I thank God for you. Thank you so much. This young man earlier today, the whole time, every time I would look, he would be like, I was like this, man, "This man is listening." Okay, I'm sorry. What is your name, sir? I'm sorry. Dalen. Dalen. Yeah, Dalen. Dalen. That's cool. That's real black. <laughs> I love black people's names. People be like tripping about black people's names, but I think they're the flyest things ever. Anyway, I'm listening. These people back here are gonna have to, okay. How much do I bench? Not a lot, not a lot at all. It's really funny, because I was like, I have to wear something like big so I don't look like I'm trying to be, you know what I mean? So I was trying to wear something that's like baggy. Am I not wearing something that's baggy? I don't look like a slut or nothing though, do I? <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh my God. It's really funny because um, after this, my, where I went to college, we're having an alumni event. And so I, I needed to wear something that I could wear from this because of Atlanta traffic to this alumni event. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be around these people and it's going to be like, you know, grown people, grown, grown. Like the president of the university is going to be there, you know? And so I was like, I got to be able to wear something that where I can like go do this and be comfortable all day at Clayton State, and I can just go and go do this other thing. But how much do I bench is what you asked me. Um, not that much. Like, whatever 70 plus 70 plus 45 is, is all. <laughs> What's 70 plus 70 plus 45? What is it? Yeah, and I should bench more, because I weigh. I need to be benching at least what I weigh, and I weigh like 190. So I need to add, yeah, I know. But that's, yeah. Why are you asking me that? You should just be trying to, like, if you're, why am I talking about this? Don't. I think, well, he asked me, so I will answer. Just try to, like, if you know what your weight is, try to start at half your weight and then build your way up from there. And literally build your way up and don't let nobody, like, bother you because people will, like, talk about you and laugh at you. They will. I'm serious. Let me, I'll show you a picture of what, I'll show you a picture after. You got to come see this picture of when I was like 27. Y'all thought I was 27 now. See, you got to see this picture of like when I was 27. But literally what I do is I, um, I'll have, I mean, I will, if I lift something, then that next week, I lift 2.5 more on each side. That's all. I don't go up more than that. <laughs> if, and then as soon as I get that two point, I go up 2.5 and I did that until I got to where I am. Which isn't a lot. I see people benching like 245s on each side and I'd be like, this walking by them. 
Anybody else? Are we done? Oh, he had a question and he didn't get to it. Maybe we'll make his the last question. Yes, sir. Lost in who? Oh, Langston Hughes. Yeah, and that was a joke. I love Langston Hughes. No, when I said I really hate Langston Hughes, I just, when I think about like writing a poem that that's good, which I hope is inspirational to all of y'all, right? Like he wrote what is still a poem folks go to, to this day. He wrote that, he wrote that poem when he was 18. No, it was sarcasm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It wasn't like that. Thank y'all so much. Thank you.